Welcome to True Diversity Film Series, Standing in Solidarity. My name is Donna walker Kuhn. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm Senior Advisor, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at New Jersey Performing Arts Center. This evening, our discussion is titled Black Jewish Allyship Through Creative Expression. This session was curated by Vera Wagman, director of the award-winning documentary, Petit Rock. The discussion will explore both Jewish people <clears throat> and the Black people who have experienced the history of intolerance and discrimination, and how we use the arts as a tool of resistance. We'll talk about how creativity is a resource for building unity and positively shaping the future. I also hope you were able to watch the film that was provided in your registration link. This social justice series is part of our Standing of Solidarity initiative. The purpose of the series is to bring our communities together and to encourage everyone to take part in the movement to ensure civil rights for all. On our website, you can find archived prior social justice panel discussions, as well as resources that will help you take action. We're also very happy to have as our advisors, the Newark NAACP, the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, Newark Arts, the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Center at Rutgers University, Newark, the Africana Institute and Essex County College, Asian American Arts Alliance, and ACLU, New Jersey. Now, NJ Pack would like to offer a land acknowledgement. The language we're using was created with consultation and guidance from Chief Dwayne okay. Perry of the Rampopo Lenape Monsi tribe and Oleana Whispering Dove of their Eastern Tulaski Algonquin descendants. We're grateful to them for their generosity, wisdom, and labor to craft these words. We, the Lenape, original benefactors of land once ripened and cultivated with attentiveness to the creator and her ascendancy, express everlasting gratitude to our creator for the traditional ancestral jurisdictions of the Muncie, Asopus, Canarsi, Capsi, Burpois, Silinoi, and Wikisquik, jointly known today as the Rampopo and Nanticote Lene Lenape. We are the Lenape hoking today and will be for the remaining days of tomorrow, keepers of the past. Let this moment of recognition be a monument of action. Let it be the beginning of hope for this, our turtle island, and for the Rampopo Lenape, the Muncie people of whose land we now trod. Here on this land, in this place of the Muncie, we acknowledge our debt to those who've come before us, to those who've been denigrated and suffered for the sake of cultural and land appropriation. Let this, our land acknowledgement, be the beginning of our return to unity. Let us be guardians of the water, the air, and the earth, the four-legged, the flyers, the swimmers, the crawlers, the mammal people, and the green. Let us now stand lifting our humanity and rapturing with Earth's consciousness as guardians of harmony and kindness. This acknowledgement demonstrates NJ Pack's ongoing commitment and working with the community to dismantle the continued legacies of colonialism, oppression, and systemic racism. And we offer a pledge of social justice awakening and education in order to raise the level of awareness and to ultimately strengthen the communal fabric, which includes engagement with our indigenous neighbors. NJ Pack would also like to thank our corporate sponsor, PSENG, for standing in solidarity for our True Diversity film series. They have consistently provided resources to enable us to produce this important work. I now have great privilege and honor to introduce our moderator for this discussion today, Rabbi Isaiah Rothstein. Isaiah Joseph Rothstein serves as rabbinic scholar and public affairs advisor at Jewish Federations of North America. He's the founder of JFNA's Initiative for Jewish Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Also the Jewish Youth Climate Movement and a community for Black Orthodox Jews. Uh, uh, Isaiah was raised in a multiracial Chabad family and sees himself as a human bridge 
connecting disparate parts of the Jewish community and America. He is very engaged in activities with the Jewish community and is one of the thought leaders that we work here with at NJPAC. Always delighted to see you and thank you so much for being with us this evening. Mm, I'm just really taking in everything you just shared, Donna. I'm so grateful uh, to you, to Katab, uh, to the New Jersey Performing Arts Center for bringing us together. What you shared, you know, someone who's from Muncie, New York, and learning that Muncie is both uh, a subtribe of the Lenape, Lenape land, and also one of the largest um, Orthodox communities in North America. Um, you know, so many truths, holding multiple truths at once, and just really a gift. And another thing you shared about being guardians of harmony. Wow, you know, as, as a musician and thinking about the role of harmony and the power of being in tune with oneself is really powerful. But if you're not in tune with others, it's much harder to uh, really build um, harmony if we're not tapping in. And, and so too uh, with dance, you know, uh, we know that when we have a dance partner where we feel like we're in rhythm with, but what happens when uh, the tempo and the beat is a little different? And I'm so grateful again to to each of you um, at, at NJPAC for bringing us together for, for this series and for being a, a beacon of light, really fostering a love for self, for community, and for strengthening the role that the arts play in healing a fractured world and, and being a medicine uh, for, for so many communities. And uh, as we jump into our panel today, and um, we have an opportunity to, to meet our panelists, um, I thought I would just briefly share a minute about who I am. And, you know, I was born and raised in Muncie, New York, um, to interracial parents who are God loving and human celebrating and redemption longing kind of people. Um, and as Black, white, and Jewish, my parents and our families uh, would share about the stories of America's lowest and greatest moments regularly and really in the pursuit um, to build a more just and equitable world. And my parents would share, since I was a child, about the African queens and kings and the miraculous survival of the Jewish people in exile. And from our freedom songs and our Hasidic melodies and our gospel songs, and from our family that's Methodist and Muslim and Buddhist, um, my aunts and uncles and cousins, our, our family could only exist uh, because of the choices of our ancestors and because of their love for freedom um, and because of an American love. And as a descendant, um, seventh generation uh, survivor of American slavery, um, as a descendant of, of people who fled Russian pogroms at the turn of the 20th century, um, you know, the theme of Black History Month this year is Black resistance. What does it mean to stand up for what one believes in? Um, and to, to think about the choices of our ancestors, how they resisted and lifted up. Um, and friends, as, as we continue and join our conversation today, and I introduce our panelists, um, a reminder for all of us that we, we know and we have the sense that America did not necessarily uh, work for everyone, that the American Jewish life story also did not work for everyone. Yes, thinking about race relations in broader society, but also race relations within Jewish life. Uh, me and my family being really a part of 20% of American Jews who identify as non-white and non-European. Um, and the, when we think about this American love story, um, this American hate story, riddled with racism, anti-Semitism, and their impacts on my family and many of our families for hundreds of years, for thousands of years, um, you know, today we have so much that we're struggling to reconcile in our generation. And today it's never in a world that seems to be never been more divided. It's such a gift that we come together on this night uh, to really discuss the role of black Jewish allyship, also black and Jewish, black Jewish um, allyship through creative expression. Um, we're gathered here to remind each other of our collective responsibility uh, to build a world that is better um, than we leave it, to build a world that we feel um, that even though we might not see 
uh, world peace or a world that is fully just and equitable in our lifetime, uh, that will still wor work towards that. Um, you know, and in the words of Lin-Manuel Miranda from his musical Hamilton, and but we'll never be truly free until those in bondage have the same rights as you as, and me. Um, and the afterlife of slavery is alive. Systemic racism is alive. White supremacy is alive. The forces that divide our communities is alive. And standing together in allyship is so essential. And as we jump into today's conversation, uh, feel free to put in the chat even, what, what does allyship mean to you? Um, what, what is the definition of allyship? Um, and as we, as we begin our conversation, I'll just share that in, in one way that I think of allyship is when, when one party sees that they have just as much to lose and just as much to gain as that other party. Instead of playing, watching the game from the sidelines, it's recognizing that, that actually if, if, you, if you do not receive what you need, I didn't receive what I need that I have just as much at stake as you do. And so with that, again, I'm grateful to NJ Pack. Um, and tonight we're gonna be exploring how creativity is a source for building unity and positivity uh, to shape our futures uh, together. Um, and with that, it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, to today's panelists for our True Diversity film series. Uh, first and foremost, the director and producer of Petit Ra, uh, Vera Wagman, like to welcome you uh, to today's to our stage, um, Anna Glass, Executive Director of the Dance Theater of Harlem. Greg Thomas, Co-Director of the Omni American Future Project, an initiative committed to fighting racism and anti-Semitism, and strengthening uni unity through music and music. And and finally, Daniel Wise, Playwright and Director of the Broadway musical Soul Doctor. The Untold Story of Rabbi Shlomo Karbach and Nina Simone and the Impact of Gospel on Jewish Music. Uh, so welcome everyone, each of you. It's so nice to meet you because in preparation for tonight, I've had a chance to learn about you, but I, I'm glad that we have an opportunity this evening and I hope that we get a chance to actually meet in person and uh, you know have time beyond the awesome time we just spent prior to our are gathering uh, today, but as we as we uh, join and and kind of root in the moment and kick off our conversation, I was hoping you'd be able to introduce yourself to us. And firstly, how are you? And also, who are you? And what brings you to this discussion? Maybe also share a little bit about the work that you do. And if anyone feels compelled to kick us off, um, in no order. I'll start. First of all, uh, thank you for that, Isaiah. Great introduction, and before that, Donna. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I do want to thank Donna and Beth Silver and Katab at and everyone at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, as well as PS E and G. Um, I also want to thank Isaiah and Anna and Greg and Dan, the thought leaders and artists who are on this panel tonight. My name is Vera Wagman. I'm the director of Petit Rat which is a project, a film project that's very personal, that took nine years to make. And the reason it took nine years to make, because there was a lot to uncover in this story of a, of a portrait between a mother and her two daughters, being my mother, Fernand, and my sister, Deborah, and myself. Uh, I do want to say that, sadly, we lost my mother in May. She was such a huge force in our life and my life. And I know she would be very, very um, happy and proud to see where this film has gone and where it is now that this film is a part of this, conver this very important conversation. So thank you again for inviting us and uh, really looking forward to talking about how we can be a part of this process, this allyship between the Black and the Jewish community. I'll, I'll jump in next. Uh, Vera, first of all, I want to extend my condolences to you. Um, I, as uh, Rabbi Isaiah shared, I'm the executive director of Dance Seat of Harlem. I proudly serve in that role, um, an organization that was born out of the civil rights movement. Um, and, and 
so grateful to have been invited to this panel. Um, I was gifted the opportunity to watch Patiha um, very early on uh, when it was going through the film festival stage um, and was very moved by the story. And I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Dance Theater of Harlem's work um, as it relates to this conversation, but do want to say that if you have not seen this film yet, it is something that um, I think really connects to all people. Um, and it was something that really moved me personally in learning about Vera's mother's story. Um, but then also a story of daughters um, and sisters, which are universal stories. And, um, and so I, I, I feel very honored um, to be part of this conversation. And thank you, NJ Pack, uh, for providing this platform for this very important discussion. I'd like to second Anna's remarks, both in terms of condolences uh, to you, Vera, and uh, a big thumbs up for the documentary, which I uh, deeply enjoyed and was moved by. Um, so I do hope that all who are watching, if you haven't seen it, please take a look. I'm Greg Thomas, and as um, the rabbi mentioned, I am the co-director of the Omni American Future Project, which is a collaboration between or among three organizations. The one that I lead, uh, the Jazz Leadership Project, um, I co-lead that with my wife, Jewel Kinch Thomas. We are collaborating with the American Sephardi Federation and the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement to work together against illiberalism and bigotry through the arts and cultural excellence. And I'll say more about that uh, when I get a chance during the discussion. I'm Danny Wise, so honored to be here. Thank you. Rabbi Isaiah, so uh, wonderful and warm to, to meet you. And thank you, of course, uh, Donna, Donna Walker Kuhn and Kitab. Um, the other panelists, Anna and Greg. And uh, Vera, I, I uh, want to tell you that we have your mother in mind very much uh, for you creating a piece that really helps her live on, you know, not, a, not just her story, but her, her, her legacy. And uh, thank you for, for sharing all of that with us. It's such a meaningful time. My father also passed away in May, and uh, I had been working with Soul Doctor. I guess I wrote and directed it on Broadway back in 2013. And my father, who I really was not that connected to in my earlier childhood, I reconnected to him later, uh, was uh, very involved with the early civil rights movement, arrested when he was in Yale, you know, on the grain for housing protests and marched with the King many times in New Haven and Chicago. My mother worked for Andrew Young in, in, in uh, Chicago for CORE and they were, it was basically what their lives was about. And uh, I grew up with freedom songs and a lot of stories about the movement. Um, and after Soul Doctor was released uh, and we were screening it, it was discovered and won some black film festivals. We were invited to Selma, Alabama. Um, and we were featured there and here I am marching over the bridge with Martin Luther King III, arm in arm and the Torah. And uh, my father uh, really started a, a, a two year heritage exchange with me uh basically about what it was to be jewish and involved with the black community for him um so i had a, a real two years of rediscovering my own heritage through working on an artistic project that tells the story really of rabbi shlomo kalerbach who was the uh, really the father of contemporary jewish music but also the father of the Jewish renewal movement in the in the aftermath of the, of the Holocaust and began a, a whole new paradigm of Jewish gospel and, and a new form of Jewish music and Jewish expression. 
Um, and, and this was really in writing the piece, I really uh, found that his turning point was his friendship with and meeting uh, then unknown Nina Simone and being introduced to black gospel and then creating this black gospel experience that we have today. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really am uh, very moved to be part of uh, a panel also connecting this with your mother and, and your legacy with your film and also mm -hmm. uh, all this wonderful collective effort to try to bring the uh, black and Jewish communities together through the arts. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a panel, for real. Thank you so much to each of you for, for really for what you're bringing to, to each of us tonight. And I'm reminded of a line from the Torah that goes, that's from the fifth book of the Torah when Moses is giving his final goodbye speech. He says, Zachor yemot olam binushnot dor vador sha'al avicha vedimecha. He basically says, he says, um, you should remember the days of old and you should try to understand what took place from generation to generation. And you should try to ask your parents and they will tell you or ask, ask your ancestors, both living and those who have left the world and just echoing both what, what Anna and Greg um, have shared about just uh, sending love and condolences and you know, may their memories be for a blessing. And it, it's a reminder for each of us to connect as much as we can to our ancestors. Sometimes uh, we don't have the luxury of knowing all of our ancestors. Sometimes uh, it's not as simple of a relationship with, with ancestors, uh, but it's a gift when we could bring the legacies um, to, to be alive in our space. And, and so on that note, you know, I, again, a lot of gratitude. And I hope we could start with you, Vera, um, you know, hearing a little bit more about the film. Um, you know, you received many endorsements tonight, and I hope that everyone uh, views the film um, as Greg shared. Um, you know, I, I would be curious if you could tell us more about Petit Ra, um, sure. and what lessons uh, do you want your viewers to really be thinking about, learn from the film, and the messages um, that most resonate for you as it relates to our discussion tonight about uh, Black Jewish, Black and Jewish um, allyship, and and I also encourage other panelists. What have you What have you been thinking about since viewing the film? What lessons um, are you gleaning as well? Uh, Bavara, please. Okay, thanks, Isaiah. I think that at first, for those who have not had a chance to see the film, just to give you a little background, um, Petit Ra is a story of my mother who wanted to be um, a ballet dancer. With the she wanted she was studying ballet. To become a dancer with the Puti, with the Paris Opera, and this was in 1940 when the Nazis invaded Paris. When that happened, she and her parents were forced to leave Paris, where they were. Uh, they basically traveled to the south of France, which was known as Vichy France. It was the quote unquote safe part of France. Um, and there, through a period of four years, they were hidden with different families who were French Christians. And um, when the war was over, she and her parents went back to Paris and uh, she wanted to go back to studying ballet. And so she went back to her teacher who, for those in the ballet world, her she was Olga Preobrazhenskaya, who was a famous ballerina uh, with the Russian Imperial Ballet many, many years before. That was her teacher. And she took one look at my mother, who was four years older and basically didn't recognize her and ignored her. And so my mother thought that was the end of her career. And she was 13. And she decided, she made a vow to herself that if she were to have daughters, they would become dancers. And that's what my sister Deborah and I became, we became dancers. And Putira is our story that took a while to tell, which is why it took a while to make, because there were many things that needed to be uncovered in this family story, in this story about war and trauma and um, dance and sisters and mothers and daughters. So I, I think one of the things that has become so clear for me in this conversation is that the themes that are 
um, shared their shared themes in our communities, in the Black and the Jewish community. And the, the first one is how humankind can be so inhuman to humankind. Um, the second is intolerance, injustice, and a systematic and systemic perpetration of genocide. The third being intergenerational trauma, what is passed down from one to the next and how it kind of can be all consuming, um, but it can also have a very positive light to it if you're aware. And that's part of the work that we've been through, particularly my sister and myself. And then lastly, it's that um, there are people who do the right thing. And in our case, uh, they are known as the righteous among nations. They are the people who helped pr protect Jews during the Holocaust and who didn't care if they were inciting with the Nazis or collaborating with the Nazis, even though it put their own lives at risk. Um, they were helping Jews and protecting Jews because it was the right thing to do. And that to me is how this all ties into the responsibility that we as individuals and as members of an alliance face. If we're talking about white supremacy, we have these tools of communication and understanding to bring us together to work through how we're going to face this, how we're gonna to continue to face what we face. And of course, power in numbers. So those, those are the ideas and the concepts for me that I feel are uniquely shared between us. And by the way, shared by all people who have been persecuted or have, who have faced injustice. Wow, super powerful, Vera. Really just all around. And thank you again um, for the incredible um, narrative that you've provided to us, the legacy of your mother, the legacy of your family. And, you know, I, I'm just uh, also, if any of the panelists would like to respond, but one thing that you're reminding me of is the righteous among the nations and talking about allyship. I remember in the film, um, I believe the son of one of the families that hid your mother um, when asked, like, why would you hide the family knowing that it was illegal, right? And Dr. King says this about, um, about the African slave trade, but also says it about Nazi Germany, that everything that Hitler did to the Jews was legal. Yes. Uh, the fact that, that the, the passport that many of us bear as Americans had a system set up also that was legal to degrade humans. But yes. this man said, what are you talking about? Like, of course I did it. Right. Like, but what do you mean? Like, we're, it's, it's not even a question. Like, we're humans. And, and it makes me think about um, our conversation about the, the Black and Jewish alliance. And a good a, a reminder for everyone, again, that's not said as a dichotomy because there, there are about a million plus Jewish people of color um, in America. But just to say that thinking about the Black Jewish alliance and Greg, the work that, that you're up to and focused on in your leadership with the Omni American Future Project. Um, I know that you've discussed in the past kind of the conversations around the historic partnerships and relationships between um, you know, Black and African Americans and Jews. Um, and also thinking about not only, yes, how we lift up and amplify and celebrate those narratives, but, but not staying stuck in the 20th century, right? Like a 20th century narrative, but also realizing that we're in 2023, it's 2023, right? We're here at the end of <laughs> January almost, we're here, but but I'm kind of curious from, from your perspective as well, um, you know, how we sort of think about, um, you know, both the challenges and the opportunities and the ways in which we celebrate uh, the Black and Jewish Alliance, um, both from the 20th century and in the 21st century. And Greg, I, I can't hear you, so I'm wondering if, just real quick, thank you. Thank you. Um, we can go back even further. You know, when I hear the righteous among the, the nations, I think about the Underground Railroad and how there were people who, um, for the sake of doing the right thing, of being human and looking at justice, 
over oppression um, were a part of that system of transporting uh, enslaved and formerly enslaved people uh, from the South to the North to Canada and, and elsewhere. So that's one connection. But in terms of the Black American, Jewish American relationship in particular, oftentimes we start with the civil rights movement, you know, in the 60s and the relationship, uh, the iconic relationship that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, that relationship and others that we can name for that time, from the perspective of the, of, of the Omni American Future Project, we see that as the second chapter in the relationship. We point to the first chapter in the relationship being the relationship between and among Black American musicians and Jewish American musicians and others, particularly Benny Goodman, who on January 16, 1938, actually desegregated Carnegie Hall by having a concert where he brought in uh, musicians in his own band like Lionel Hampton and Teddy Wilson, but also greats from the Count Basie Orchestra, including Count Basie, to a concert at Carnegie Hall thus integrating that august institution. But the relationship goes back even further. Louis Armstrong is known as the paterfamilias, the father of jazz. Well, when he was a boy, he used to work for a Jewish Lithuanian family called the name the Konofskis. And he would work with them, eat dinner with them. He would hear the mother sing Russian lullabies and and he says uh, later that it helped to instill in him the love of singing from the heart. But in actuality, they helped him to purchase his first cornet. He was passing by a pawn shop and saw this old broken down B flat cornet. And it was $5 at the time. So he got an advance of $2 against his pay to put down the down payment and put down 50 cents a week until he bought that cornet. So the very music that you know many think, and I certainly think, is the greatest musical representative of American ideals ever, jazz music, has a connection to Louis Armstrong, who has a connection to a Jewish family that helped him when he was young. So this is a very deep, cultural bond, not just the political and civil rights. And we look at the third chapter being right now, where we can continue this legacy and leverage the relationship um, and use our relationship as a bridge and an example for other groups who can work together towards good and against liberalism and bigotry. Mm, so deep, amen. I mean, I mean, all around. And it's it's a profound reminder. I don't know if anyone has this instinct when they think about Black and Jewish, Black-Jewish relations um, to immediately go to the political and to immediately go to civil rights and Dr. King and Abraham Joshua Heschel, as you said. And it's just a, a profound reminder of, of the fabric of what even relationships look like when we when we break bread together, when we sing together, when we dance together, when we we break ceilings uh, together, and when we build coalition together, and and then also the power of music. You know, uh, actually in my high school yearbook, the quote from Maya Angelou, two quotes I put in my yearbook was, "And still I rise." And just the note of music and how it like kind of ebbs and flows and the how the scales kind of you know you could have such a wide range of of the the flows and the ebbs and flows of, of living in life and then another is uh music was my refuge um i i could crawl into a space between the notes mm -hmm. um, and curl my back to loneliness and you know there's this part of it that feels sad but it's a part of it that feels liberating in a way that i could I could find refuge with something. And I know the arts does that for so many to help empower so many different kinds of people um, to heal people from different places um, that they exist. So Greg, just thank you for the reminder of the tapestry that's beyond the, the political 
um, to root us in the histories and the parts, the stories, the eras, um, you know, and I imagine we have a good reading list for folks too, if you're interested. I'm also seeing in the chat about the Rosenwald schools, 5,000 different schools, an mm -hmm. epic partnership. Many of people who went through those schools became presidents of HBCUs, historically black colleges, and became elected officials, Congress, Senate, like, you know, pretty wild, the impact of partnership coming together in education, as well as, you know, as the arts and other sectors. So it's a profound reminder. Um, and with that, you know, on the note of how the arts could really um, empower us and lift us up um, and thinking through, yes, on, on the musical side, let's say thinking through jazz, but also uh, the power of dance. Um, you know, Anna, I was hoping that, you know, when hearing also about uh, the work that you're doing um, as the executive director of Dance Theater for Harlem, you know, and the work that you're doing to ensure that, you know, really anyone and everyone that comes through your door has access uh, to the art form of ballet. And, and I love that word to think of through access and ensuring that um, that nobody and no one is left out regardless of their race or their class or their gender. And, you know, hearing more about the work that you're doing for Dance Theater of Harlem, can you specifically share about how your work has been lifting people up, empowering the generation, uh, thinking through about how we right wrongs and addressing racial inequity, um, both in ballet, um, but also just how you see the work uh, that we're discussing tonight come to life through the work that you do each day. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. So just to, to, to give a little background, Dance Seat of Harlem was founded in 1969. Um, in 1968, as, as many are aware, uh, Dr. King was assassinated and Arthur Mitchell, who's the founder of Dance Seat of Harlem, he was on his way to the airport um, to go to Brazil. He'd been asked by the State Department to create a ballet company in Brazil. And on his way to the airport, he heard over the radio that Dr. King had been assassinated and turned right back around and, and just had made the decision that he wanted to be part of the fulfillment of Dr. King's dream and decided that he needed to give back to the community that had given so much to him, Harlem. And, and his art form of choice was ballet. This was an art form that had historically um, uh, locked out Black people, people who did not look a particular way um, from participating in this art form. And he felt very strongly when you learn ballet, you learn discipline, you learn perseverance, you learn uh, the ability to believe in yourself and that with these tools, you can go off and do anything in the world. And so that was really a big part of who and what Dance Theater of Harlem is about. It is creating opportunities, um, providing access so that all types of people have the ability to excel. We are also an institution that feels very strongly that ballet should reflect the best of all of us, that, that it should reflect the diversity of this, of this country. And, and that is not only by the way our dancers look, where they come from, it is also the types of ballets we put on stage. It is who is on the boardroom, who is in our staff, all of it, the communities that we perform across the country. And, and an example of that is a work that we were fortunate enough to finally premiere um, this past April. It was a ballet that we performed with the Klezmatics, um, the Grammy award-winning Klezmer band. This ballet um, actually started in 2019. Um, it, we were supposed to perform it in 2020, but the pandemic hit. And so um, it sort of was on the shelf for a while. But during the pandemic, because we were virtual, we still found opportunities and ways to engage with the Klezmatics. And so we did an online program together that was really created by the both of us, both very interest dis, disparate institutions on some way in some you know ways but but also united in a lot of ways and we created this program it was actually right out of um following the the murder of George Floyd and we assigned each dancer a dancer to a musician and each dancer musician combo they created their own work together um one musician composed a, an original piece of music and a dancer created a, 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 a little short ballet, a video ballet together. Um, 
and we we just had this program together, which is about just what we both bring to the table. And we finally were able to perform this work live um, in this past April. But what was so beautiful about this ballet is seeing these two organizations coming together. It was really the embodiment of what we believe that ballet should reflect all of us. You know, um, you know, I, I I love story ballets. I think they're wonderful. But I always say I don't know when's the last time anybody saw a fairy, or you know, a Nutcracker come to life. You know, and so it is important that that young people in particular see themselves. They see people coming together. They're seeing different voices coming together. Um, I loved I loved what was said earlier about the guardians of harmony because that really expresses um, what the work of Dance Theater of Harlem is about, what this particular ballet was about. Um, and, and our hope is that we have the opportunity to tour together um, you know, across the country. That's something that we're, we're working on as well so that more people can see this gorgeous work. Um, but the one thing I do wanna just say, just sort of going back to what Vera said earlier, is you know one of the other reasons why the work her film connected so much to me you know we when we think about ballet this is also part of who dance out of harlem is we think about it as some exclusive art form it's for those people that are extremely wealthy or maybe you had a phd in ballet and you sort of you understand what you're seeing on stage and but really it's just this beautiful it's this beautiful thing right? It's this, it's the embodiment of, of love. It's the embodiment of, um, of grace. It's, it's, it's just all these wonderful things about it that we, we sort of, uh, ascribe different meanings to it, but ultimately it's, it's love, you know, it's, it's movement, it's grace, it's beauty. And, and that was the thing that I love so much about Vera's film is that at the, at the core you know, again, it's these things that connect us. At the core, it is about beauty. It is about um, wanting, you know, the opportunity to express oneself. And in the backdrop is this extraordinary history. You know, it, it, Arthur Mitchell, you know, creating this company, this ballet company in the backdrop of the civil rights movement, just unheard of, right? And, and, and Vera's mother, you know, just, experiencing this art form in the backdrop of, you know, Nazis in France. I mean, it's just like, that was the, oh, also, wow. also the piece, right? Wow. Oh, man. Can I, can I ask Daniel a question? Of course. Great. Uh, one of the themes that I, in our conversation, we haven't used the word, but I've mentioned jazz. Uh, we're talking about dance. We're talking about how um, you know, through historical relationships and also trauma, the the word and the form of the blues comes to mind for me. The blues, and the blues is uh, a, a creation of, of Black Americans that uh, is the foundation, actually, of gospel music. Um, so I wanted Daniel to, to, to speak about that in terms of gospel, uh, if you wouldn't mind in terms of your project, mm -hmm. but I want to mention, I just want to say that the blues is not just an expression of sadness, not just a lament. It's a way mm -hmm. of through song, through facing one's problems and the reality of looking at it straight in the face, straight, no chaser. <laughs> and singing through it is a way to actually bring healing. And this is something that is in both of our communities. So I just want to, wow. to state that, you know? Yeah, I happen to be years before Soul Doctor, uh, among my many mentors who are from the, uh, the African-American community, uh, Chuck Berry was... I was very close to Chuck and we, we were all over the world together. I was very much part of him producing his last album. So I've spent many years and many months in his house and hanging with him and uh, uh, learning all about what really, what blues is, rock and roll is basically what he would call uh, 
gospel blues or gospel jazz, you know, uh, and and uh, his storytelling. Uh, he was, by the way, considered himself a Cherokee Indian. He, it's, you know, he was partially African American, but that's something else I should mention. And, and I think that that yes, I think that uh, when it, not just in terms of music itself, but everything that the blues and gospel and jazz represent in terms of the jazz age and the blues age and the way we relate to each other uh, as people socially. I think that um, this influence of certainly through Shlomo Kalbach being so immersed in the black, going to a black church every Sunday of his life, um, you, you, you uh, see today people like Rabbi Isaiah Rothstein, who really speak in a completely different way and relate in a completely different way than the rabbis, the European yeshiva rabbis, uh, even Shlomo Kalbach himself, before he really became exposed to the black culture. Um, this is really something that being so present and being so warm and it being really about opening people's hearts rather than trying to change their minds. Both Nina and Shlomo uh, wanted to change the world. They saw themselves as artists of people who wanted to change their, the world, but not through necessarily political activism, as because before you change people's hearts, they thought the way to change the world was to wake up the world by opening people's hearts. And, and I think that's uh, so much of what Anna and Vera and Greg, you were talking about, uh, Isaiah as well. And, and that's in the music, but it, it, you have to see how it permeates way beyond the music especially when you hang out with people, you mentioned the blues, it's, you can't learn to play the blues. You have to really spend time with these people. And, and that's where the cross influence really, really became a cross cultural cultivation where we started influencing each other's, each other spiritually. I just wanna uh, say for a moment, Anna, thank you so much for your beautiful words about the film. Um, you know, there is this um, all of these all of these things that we're talking about music, dance, art in any form. There is this this unifying feeling that um, when you experience something, you get it, you know it. And I think with Petira, there is this opportunity to have this kind of discussion because there is a universal theme to it of, you know, aside from all of the themes that we're talking about and that we've already mentioned, just that we can have empathy for a people who have gone through what they've gone through and what they've lost in the process. So there is that universality to it that, that uh, again, is a connector. Yeah. no matter what that form is. Right. Mm. Wow, wow, so sweet, really. And just in hearing from each of you, a, a theme that I'm hearing and something I'm thinking about is this idea of using the arts as creative expression. And Anna, you shared about story ballet, and I've never heard that actually before, but I was thinking about the stories that we tell through art. I was wondering if you could maybe share a little more about that. And Greg, you know, you were sort of sharing texture of, of blues versus jazz and almost different modes of story of how, how expression is shared within the arts and really came out uh, through the film in such a powerful way. And Anna, you also shared about the backdrop of when being in an oppressive regime to still share out your voice. And it, it deeply reminds me of the Torah portion um, you know, Jews around the world on Saturday morning have a, a weekly Torah portion on an annual cycle, and it's about the exodus. It's about leaving um, Pharaoh's regime. And what's wild is what are the first things that the enslaved Hebrews did after being enslaved for 230 years? The first things they did was they sang and they danced. And in terms of expression and being able to use your own voice after feeling like you're carrying the weight of the world and, and that in a way that you're the stories that you've wanted to tell and that your DNA and you're pulsing through the intergenerational relationship. 
wanting to tell. And it's just the theme that I've been hearing so far. And I'm wondering if anyone wants to respond to that a little more. You know, I, I will say this, and it was something, Rabbi Isaiah, that you said earlier. Um, and and Dan, you know, the work that you did, um, you know, with the stories itself, I think it's always important that we continue telling our stories and not being afraid to embrace our stories and not being afraid to listen to other people's stories. You know, I think that was also sort of the, the beauty of, of this project that we did with the Klezmatics is that it all it introduced people who had never heard of the Klezmatics to the Klezmatics and, and, and vice versa, people who knew the Klezmatics but had never heard of Dance State of Harlem. And so, you know, I, I really feel that, you know, again, it's always wonderful to have moments of, of fantasy but it's also equally wonderful when you are learning stories that you just, you weren't aware that are real stories. Um, that if we don't tell these stories become forgotten, that these people become forgotten. And, and I am someone who feels very strongly that we are, we are doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past if we don't, if we're not aware of them. And, and the only way that we can ensure that we don't mistake, make those mistakes is if we, we understand those stories and understand them in its full totality, you know, understand all the aspects of them, the good, the bad, the beauty that came out of those stories. You know, I think that that's, you know, as equally as important. And so, um, you know, one of the things I want to encourage the viewers uh, today is to, to not be afraid to hear other people's stories, to see other people's work. You know, you may be someone who's, you know, I love classical music. I love it. I love it. I love it. Go hear some jazz. You know, I, I've always seen this ballet company. Go see that ballet company. You know, I think it's really important that we we not find ourselves limited in, in the lanes that we think because of our cultural background or where we grew up or how much money we may have that we sort of limit our experiences because um, as I, you know, again, I'm sorry, I keep on waxing poetic about the film, but I saw so much of, you know, what was important to me in that film. And that wasn't my story. It was Vera's story. It was her mother's story. It was her sister's story, but there was so much of what I could experience about my own humanity from that story. And I think that's what's important about experiencing each other's cultures. And I would agree. I'm, I, I just press send to a, a, a link to the second annual Omni American Future Project event that was held um, in Harlem at Minton's uh, Playhouse and Cecil's Restaurant. Um, and it featured uh, the, the story that I alluded to earlier you know, with images, with live music um, led by the Itamar Borokov Quartet that had Jewish Americans, Black Americans, Asian Americans, like United Nations in his band. Uh, and we tell the story and the power of music and the power of the arts, it taps into our feeling tones. It taps into our souls and our spirits. That's ultimately the deepest, I think, aspect of the arts and of creativity because you're tapping into the very creative impulse that created everything. So when we when we when we do that and we can do that together, it gives us a way of seeing together, even with our differences, of feeling into things together and being together and experiencing these these wonderful forms together. And with that, we realize that we can conquer. Love can conquer. The arts can conquer. Now, the blues is going to come back in the morning. Don't get it wrong. Don't get it twisted. The blues ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Bigotry is not going anywhere. But we can still fight against resentment, and we still can work together towards good. And that's what we should be doing. Mm, so good. So, so great. Daniel, any thoughts on this? So you're unmuted. I'd love to hear. You know, I, I just in Vera's story and, and in all the stories of, of the heroic, uh, James Baldwin might say, the once in a while human beings save other human beings. 
and that's something we we have to believe in. Um, but there's two sides to those stories, and I think there's uh, there's there's the love and the respect side. And I I think um, when the rabbi Rabbi Isaiah, when you first began talking about an alliance, about how alliance is is really based on the understanding we both receive from each other, you know, there's too much too. Well, there's bountiful stories being told out there about how the Jews helped the African Americans in in music and in sports and in business and in the civil rights movement. Um, but that's really a, a love story, you know, about how someone cared about someone else and they benefited someone else. Uh, they saved someone from the Nazis in Vichy, France. But, uh, you know, Anna, Anna, your story of cosmetics, uh, uh, you know, creating a ballet at the Dance Theater of Harlem is a respect story. And I think that's something, that's the story of Soul Doctor. It was, it was not about how, uh, people ask me all the time, were they lovers, Shlomo and Nina Simone? They respected each other and they learned from each other and they were influenced by each other because of that respect. Benny Goodman didn't save, you know, wasn't wasn't doing heroic act by bringing the black musicians onto the stage in Carnegie Hall. That great story that you told. Benny Goodman was was simply uh, uh, doing what was right and righteous because there would be no jazz if not for these people on the stage. Benny Goodman would not be known and not be famous, and he was doing something for America. It was based on that, and you know, Anna. I know that Balanchine wasn't a Jew, but but you know, when 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 Arthur Mitchell came to George Balanchine, and this is my point about what our message is, you know, and Bal and the same thing when he married Maria Tolchi, who was as all the ballerinas at that time, Lakota Indians, you know, he went out there to learn about them, as did Martha Graham. It was a respect. You cannot collaborate on any artistic project without there being an enormous amount of, of co-mentorship and co-respect and understanding that each each one of you has to go back into their own heritage and their own past and their own ancestry and their own cultural uh, uh, you know archives and, uh, and, and uh, become stronger and more powerful in who they are. Uh, and that was Nina Simone's black power message that black people, in order for them to help the world, to become powerful, need to rediscover who they are, this cultural erasure that America so so uh, proficiently uh, enacted on, on the Native Americans and then the African Americans. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the, the more powerful uh, we are connected, powerfully we're connected to our heritage, and I mean the African heritage and the Jewish heritage. When we collaborate together as artists, we're truly creating something new. We're really bringing worlds together, and 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 that's really a cosmic event. You know, when when great celestial bodies collide, that's what creates these supernovas, cultural supernovas that we have in America today. Amen. I just want to say a big old amen to that. I, I second that amen. <laughs> I third. <laughs> yeah, and Arthur Fourth. Mitchell, I mean, changed changed ballet in America because he became the first uh, male ballet dancer, essentially. And and uh, George Balanchine went on to become an abstract dance interpreter after that so you know it was because when we're doing something collaboratively we're bringing our entire heritage and culture into it and our worlds and our peoples together we're actually right. bringing people together that's right that's absolutely right and you know i love what you said about respect and really that's it that just you encapsulated it so perfectly daniel that you know that that really is really i i, I know um rabbi isaiah you need to wrap us up I want to say this. I just want to say this. No, I, I don't. I, I don't want to be the one to wrap okay, this. Up. Well, I'm not wrapping up. I'm not doing the final word. But I do want to just say that how what a gift this conversation has been. I you know I think we could be continued talking, and I I know that there was a lot of um, wonderful um, discussion happening in the chat, and and thank you. I think it was Lynn who said uh, such wonderful words about Dance Theater of Harlem. I really appreciate that. Um, but this has just been 
what a gift, you know, the work of an arts administrator, um, you know, being in this world, it is, it is filled with a lot of joy, but also a lot of hard work. And so I, I feel so grateful to be ending my work day um, on such a wonderful high note. And, and Dan, just, you know, I, you, you really just filled me up. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Mm, so great. So great. And what, you know, I have another question for you, if it's okay, everyone, before we maybe turn to some audience uh, Q&A. So if you do have any questions for our lovely panelists this evening, feel free to put it in the chat. There's also a Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we would love to hear some of your thoughts, comments, questions um, as it relates to our discussion tonight. You know, another theme I heard that I thought came through really powerful in this last round of sharing was the role of like spirit. And whether you put that in capital letters, you know, uh, discussing calling it, the, you know, the source for all that is God, the universe, he, she, they, like all of the above, something beyond time. But the role of spirit, the role um, that 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 uh, something bigger than any one of us plays within the, each of uh, your work and how your work um, ha comes together and fuses, I'm, I'm reminded of a teaching uh, from the Kabbalists, from the uh, meta spiritual Hasidic masters of the 16th, 17th, 18th century. They they call out the fact that in the Torah, from the six days of creation. The sun, the moon, and the stars were created on day four. So the measurements of time for day one, two, and three were not the sun, the moon, and, and the sun and the moon. So therefore, what was the light that is described for day one? It says that there was light created. So what was that light if it wasn't the sun, the moon, and the stars? So the rabbis teach that it was it's the hidden light of creation. And Greg, you reminded me of that. You said something about this force this, that, that connects us. Daniel, you were saying the cosmic force. It was sort of connecting these dots. And they say that this hidden light of creation, the Or HaGanuz, is something that is reserved for the artist, for creativity. And that this creative force that pulses through us is sort of part of that light from, from the creation narrative before the sun, the moon, and the stars. And so I'm kind of wondering what role, and this has already come up many times, I think, in our discussion, but what role does spirit, faith, belief, something cosmic, bigger than all of us, again, I'm giving a lot of different descriptors for uh, for the infinite, um, but how does it show up for you? I'm going to I'm going to not deflect from your question, because I think I've already riffed on that. I actually want to answer it by referring to a word that you mentioned very early. You mentioned about ancestors, and I think a few others have mentioned about ancestors. And I just want to share something that uh, one of my um, great um, icons of thought and of music, Ralph Ellison, one of the things he said is that artists you know, we, we all have our relatives. We were born in certain families, right? He says, you can't choose your relatives, but you can choose your ancestors. So I just want to say that choose those in your own lineage and the lineage of others who aspire to greatness, moral greatness, cultural greatness, spiritual excellence. Tap into that. Make those people your ancestors and then strive for the same. That, that, that's how I'll answer that question. That's so great. That's so great, uh, Greg. It's, it's, it's so true. And so it resonates with me. Um, I think spirit, spirit for me shows up in many ways. It shows up, uh, of course, with being with family, being with friends. Creatively, it shows up in the pro in dance for me in, in a class. If I'm working on something that involves dance, if I'm working in on a film project, if I'm working on a on an event, an arts event, whatever it is, that spirit is what comes through at that moment. Whether that is the creative spirit, whether it's different 
or the same or a different form, but it's a very powerful thing that we can all connect with, you know, and it is just in a sense, listening for it because it's there. It's intuitive. It's there. It's present. You just have to hear it and feel it. I love that, Vera. And I, I will add to that. Um, it, it's sort of a combination of both what Greg and Vera have just said. In my household, we speak about benevolent guidance. And, and, and that comes from our ancestors. It comes from um, uh, spirit with a capital S, God, um, you know, however one sort of um, identifies. And it, it shows up God's beauty shows up in all sorts of places for, for me, you know, it, it, um, this conversation is, is God showing up as a reminder of the importance of my work. And, um, uh, you know, I was sharing before we all joined, um, and I won't get into the, the background, but how Veer and I came to know one another was God showing up, um, you know, two people that would have otherwise never had any sort of interaction, but had a very random um, uh, occurrence and, and now have a relationship, you know, that is where God showing up. It's Daniel, you know, reflecting back to me, the importance of dance theater of Harlem in that history, that is God showing up. And so, you know, it, it is, it is our ancestors. It is, it is God, it is spirit. It is all of it. Um, and I think what's really important and what I try to do, and, and I try to do it in my work as a creative is listen, is to not um, be beat up by the stuff of life, you know, to find moments of still and, and to, and to listen and to listen. Just, just listening. Oof. Wow. 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 Yeah, we should be blessed. We should be blessed to uh, each in our own way to hear to hear the call from within, the call from our ancestors, the potential call from our descendants. What are they calling to us to? Um, you know, and as we um, as we come in for a landing from our discussion, I hope it's really just the beginning and the takeoff in certain ways. I hope um, you know there's a an anonymous attendee put in the Q and A. So we're in Newark. Are we going to see a combination of dance, gospel events with Jewish music? Let's not be shy. So I think we've already had uh, a request for our round two. Uh, maybe we could bring out our instruments, have a good dance floor, and see see what comes out of that. Um, that would be really special. And we really just want to thank each of you. I, I feel also, you know, um, Anna, as you shared, to end my my day, to kick off my week to kick off my year, to kick off the rest of my life um, with this discussion. Um, and really just Vera, like, wow, what a powerful gift uh, you've provided to each of us um, to really bring us together, again, with NJ Pack for, for your leadership, both on your professional team at NJ Pack and your lay leadership and the, the paths that we're trying to forge for the 21st century for this next generation and being able to root ourselves uh, with our ancestors is a holy gift. So as you know, as we transition um, for the rest of our evening and the rest of our week, um, there is a question in the chat that I think uh, is really a, a profound one, you know, getting caught up in the storms and the noise of some of the headlines that come across our, our you know, I don't know what, whatever screen you might have um, or screens um, that surround you, you know, I think uh, we sometimes get get caught up in the negative. And I think this conversation tonight was such a, a profound reminder of bringing a love based approach. Um, you know, and as Dr. King said, uh, there is no love without justice. And uh, part of love is restorative justice is holding multiple truths, uh, leaning in with vulnerability. These are 
uh, restorative justice practices, truth telling, um, and, and I believe in a real way uh, tonight, we've been able to do that for our communities that have showed up. And uh, for those who weren't able to make it high from the recording, we hope uh, we hope mm -hmm. they also join us at our newer um, round two whenever we get there. Uh, there was a question from Michael. That, Michael, thank you. What do you think about um, how we repeat the good uh, where there's historic precedent for good, where there's historic precedent where there has been um, a shift or a bridge, um, a moment of allyship really stepping up, whether it's the righteous amongst the nations, whether it's instead of saviorship, it's allyship and saying, we are building this together and that this is about each of us. Are there examples? What are, what are ways in which we could be repeating the good trouble, um, repeating good history and, and uh, how do we do this? And how can we do this? I haven't thought about this. I, I, and it's, Michael, it's a great question and it's a, it's a tough question. Um, but I think the way to approach it is to understand that this goes back to Anna's point earlier about knowing history, knowing what has happened in the past and what is our own responsibility in how we live our lives to make sure that we're supporting the good things, the right things in life, uh, the right ways of thinking that are filled with justice, filled with collaboration between people. Um, I think it starts within, I think it's a conversation you start with yourself and then it blooms out into your family, into your friends, into your community, and then conversations like the one we're having happen. And to the anonymous attendee who asks what's next, we're all thinking about that. And, you know, we only have an hour tonight to talk about this, but I do believe that this is a jumping off point and that uh, we are open to extending and furthering this conversation. So um, I have some ideas about it. And uh, I'm going to put my email in the chat. So whoever wants to have a conversation about how this could continue, and I'll share some of my ideas with you then, um, happy to do so. Thank you for that, Vera. Yes. Hmm. Well, friends, before we enter into our fi a final closing round of questions to each of you uh, for our audience around, how do we channel everything from tonight? Um, how do we bring that into our lives? I thought maybe we could take a moment um, and friends reflect in the chat, what's, what's something that's percolating in your mind coming up for you from our discussion today? Um, I'll serenade you while you write in the chat. What's something that's <laughs> kind of coming up for you? Deep inside my heart I want to let it shine, yeah Deep inside my heart the way 
ways I dance speak for me. And when I get to the end of the road and I lay down my heavy load, may the friends I make speak for me. And may the films I make And may way the Broadway shows I make Speak for me Friends, each of us And may the life I lead Speak for me May the life I lead Speak for me and when I get to the end of the road And I lay down my heavy load This conversation, I would, I would allow this conversation, I would love for this conversation to speak for me. Thank you, friends. That's such a gift. And as, as we come in for a landing, I would just love to hear from you. One, what, what kind of gives you hope? What are you dreaming about? Like, what, what gives you hope? And what are you trying to bring into the world as, you know, in this moment? And also, how can we connect with you? What are things that we should be doing together? What's some things you want to send um, into the ether for our audience and for each of us to be thinking about as we uh, continue on our journey? Well, first of all, Isaiah, that was so beautiful. That alone gives me hope, the beauty of your song and your artistry. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I think what does give me hope is the, the ability to have this conversation and to know that we're going to continue this conversation. That is part of the action that comes out of an experience like this. I wanna also share um, a video that was uh, directed by uh, Lacey Schwartz Delgado, who is the uh, wife of the Lieutenant Governor of New York, the state of New York, the great state of New York, um, Antonio Delgado. She is a filmmaker, a brilliant filmmaker, and she created a piece about, uh, it's called Black and Jewish. And it's very much along these lines of what we're talking about. So I'm gonna share that in the chat. Thank you again, everybody for joining us and, and to Isaiah and to everyone at uh, New Jersey Performing Arts Center. I would just say this, keep sharing stories of hope, stories of respect, stories of love and healing um, because we know that there are all kinds of negativities built into our experience, our histories. And, and, and saying negativities is kind of an understatement when you look at the real depths of depravity that um, you know man's inhumanity to, 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 to man to men, women and children and other, um, but we have these stories, we have these conversations, we have these histories of working together, of collaborating, of still overcoming, of still being resilient. Um, and let's find faith and hope in those stories, in those real, uh, you mentioned early, Anna, you know, about fantasies. Well, there's so many truly heroic stories actual real stories of the past and present that we can lean on. And um, I'm just grateful for being able to participate in this conversation. Um, I, I'm putting into the chat just a, a link to the website for the Omni American Future Project, which has um, information there and footage of our first and second annual programs. I invite you all to check that out. And I just want to thank NJ Pack, Donna, Vera, um, uh, Rabbi, Isaiah, Daniel, Anna. It's, it's been a pleasure. 
I want to echo that. Uh, this has been really wonderful. And I, in the chat is my email address, but I will put it back in as well for anybody who wants to reach out. And Lynn and Michael, thank you so much for your comments and invitations. And um, I, you know, agree with what Vera and Greg said. You know, I am, I am taking away from this conversation a renewed sense of inspiration. So thank you all. In terms of hope for me, well, you know, sometimes you look at the country and you say it's hopeless. I don't know how this country could fix itself because nobody really cares. And uh, so I, I, I think we're all, you know, there's going to be a time in history that people will just look back at us and see us as Americans, uh, not just Jews or Africans or black people. We're, we're really Americans and we're telling America's story. And, and I'll tell you this, that in the 50s and 60s, Hollywood was not uh, part of, the Jews in Hollywood were not the, the ones who were helping the civil rights movement. They, Hollywood didn't do anything to help change this country for the better, and they're not going to. Um, and, and that's why it's so hopeful to, for, for me to sit on a panel like this with people who really understand what it means to be uh, shaping the imagination of this country and the world of the future. It's so, so important. Uh, people like Vera, who, who are really telling a story of not, not uh, victimhood, but of, of what it really means to give to the country and to commit as a storyteller and as an artist. Um, you know, you guys, you independent and, and arts driven uh, uh, entrepreneurs and, and, uh, and uh, pioneers are really, I think, giving me a lot of hope that uh, we can start changing the narrative. So lots of blessings to all of you. Amazing. You know, thinking about um, our ancestors you know, brought us to this moment. We've been sent in certain ways and, and we're sent to, uh, to also continue the rest of our lives. Um, so as we come into a landing for today's discussion, just a really big thank you um, to everyone who's attended the program and to each of our panelists for bringing your heart and your mind, your spirit, um, for joining us, for being here. It was really such, such a pleasure uh, to be able to facilitate this discussion and join each of you and really grateful again to the leadership uh, coming out of NJPAC who are really uh, chartering the path for what it means to be to build resilient communities centering art creating um, diversified access points so that each person could express who they are um, to build upon uh, their own legacies to build upon new legacies um, just a gift again that we could be together and so as we close, uh, to bring in one of our illustrious and fearless leaders um, who really helped uh, really bring this, bring all of us together, uh, Donna Walker uh, Kuhn to help close off uh, the remainder of this evening. And thank you again to everyone. Thank you. My goodness, what a spiritual experience. Katab and I were, were texting each other. Rep, um, Rabbi Isaiah, We've been producing these panels now for three years. We've never had anyone sing. So this was a first. Everyone brought it out in me. I was like, I need to sing right now. <laughs> we, we, we've had all kinds of experiences. This was really unique. So thank you for this golden memory. Um, also, please uh, you know, accept our deep appreciation, Vera, for bringing the film you know, to our attention and allowing us to share in your family story. Uh, providing this film as a platform for such a rich discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, our panelists, Anna Glass, Greg Thomas, and Danny Wise, sharing your hearts was so wonderful and giving us a, a way forward. I mean, it wasn't just a lo lovely conversation, but a way forward, you know, and we can tell from the chat of the interest of our wonderful audience. And we thank you, audience, for always tuning into our standing of solidarity and taking action in our communities to transform, you know, our society into a more humanistic one. 
Also want to extend our deepest appreciation to PSE and G for allowing us, you know, through their support uh, to continue to explore what a social justice look like. So next month, we'll be right back here, uh, February 27th, and our topic will be prison reform. Our film will be Just Mercy, which some of you have probably seen. Uh, and it's going to be a really dynamic <clears throat> discussion. It will be curated by ACLU New Jersey. Um, and then also this Thursday, we will have through our arts education department, they also host social justice learning series for arts educators and teaching artists. And they will be um, having a session this Thursday on social justice as well. So thank you so much, everyone. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.